what do you think of when I mention the 2010s? Super teens? something to say, words can't describe it. For once in my life, I'm speechless. LeBron's reign of the Eastern Conference. Way from behind, takes it away. Chalmers, pulls, down! Curry's three-point revolution. Curry to win! Good! Good! One tenth left! The last decade in the NBA was kind of crazy to say the least, with too many moments to remember and too many champions as well. The decade had seven different teams win an NBA championship, which is only second to the 1970s, the decade of parody. So who's gonna remember all of those champions? Well, I'm here to do it for you. This decade had one of, if not the best championship runs in NBA history. I mean, there were so many runs that I could only fit four in one video. And that's what we're gonna do today. From 2010 to 2014, we're gonna recap their runs, figure out how they did it, and most importantly, figure out what happened to them. After being unable to come out of the first round for the first three years of the post Shaq era, the Lakers struck gold in the 2007 through 2008 season, trading for the older Gasol. Powell not only provided an inside presence that the Lakers desperately needed, but he also took the much needed weight off of Kobe's back. Kobe, how nice a feeling is it to know that you can score six points and still have a victory come out? You have no idea. It, you know, just make the game so much easier. Gasol's presence was enough to help the Lakers make the finals in 2008. However, it wasn't enough to get them over the hump. The team ran into the 2008 Celtics, who were the best defensive team in the league by a large margin. Brian Scalabrini, aka White Mamba, aka The Goat, thinks they are one of the best defensive teams of all time. He did play on that team, so he's hardly impartial. Boston's defense smothered the Lakers' offense, and the consensus around this time was that Gasol was too soft. There was uh, a lot of physicality. We had an ejection. They lost in six, partially due to talent discrepancy, partially due to Paul Pierce's, um, heft. He really understood how to use his body. He would use his heft. Yeah to shield you. All right, all right. Moving on. Next year, Kobe came more prepared than ever. Gasol came back harder and more motivated. And the rest of the team, well, clicked. And the Lakers ran through the playoffs. But one ring wasn't enough. The team was going for a repeat. However, one piece was missing. In the summer of 2009, the Lakers lost Trevor Ariza, who played a huge role on the team, often playing great defense down the stretch and hitting timely shots. They guarded each other much in this fourth quarter. Trevor Ariza with the steal. Ariza tiptoes. Ariza with the steal. Fisher, Ariza, touch pass to Brian. Yeah. Ariza signed with the Rockets for basically the same amount of money. Luckily, there came a perfect replacement. They said, you want to go to the Lakers? They, 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 said, they said, the Lakers want, want to talk to you. And I said, for what? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> what do you niggas want to talk to me about? So then, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Don't hurry, man. <laughs> These niggas kick my ass and shit. Ron Artest has been one of the best defensive players of the past decade. He's been known for breaking people's ribs in practice. However, Ron was an underrated offensive talent, and Kobe was clear with Ron from the get-go. You're coming here to replace a player that was like a brother to me, and still is to this day. So I better not get any bullshit from you. And I'm expecting you to be extremely sharp, be extremely crisp, and I won't have it another way. The Lakers were ready for another title run. The team did struggle with injuries at the beginning of the season though, as you're seeing right here. And they lost a couple of games in a row around the All-Star break. However, a couple of vintage Kobe game winners and winning streaks later, they finished the season strong. Has to put it up with the buzzer. Backs it in. <laughs> the Lakers for the win. Kobe going up over Bell. Ball away. Yes. Yes. yes! The they entered the playoffs with a 57 and 25 record and a number one seed in the Western Conference. In the first round, they had an exciting six game series with the young OKC Thunder. Don't worry, that's not the last time we'll speak about them in this video. That series finished on an amazing Gasol buzzer beater. For the lead, misses Gasol. Backs it in with five. Of a second from they swept the Jazz in the second round and played another hard-fought series in the conference finals against the Suns. That series included a classic game five that was finished by an R-Test offensive rebound and winning layup. Bryant and comes up short on the Lakers were back in the finals for the third year in a row. There, they would rematch the Boston Celtics, the team that beat them two years ago. The series went back and forth and back and forth for six games. 
culminating in a game seven in Los Angeles. Kobe was having one of his worst shooting nights going six for 24. Two players that gave LA the edge over Boston were Gasol with 19 points, 18 rebounds, and some timely shots in the fourth as seen here, and Ron Artest with 20 points, five steals, and a late game three that I think we all remember. Kobe passed me the ball. The black mom. You gotta rain now. Kobe passed me the ball. We never passed it. We never passed it. In the end, Kobe got his second finals MVP, Phil got his 13th ring, and the Lakers got their 16th title. But why did the dynasty stop there? Post-championship, the Lakers had another great regular season in which they looked like candidates to three-peat. With LeBron in Miami, everyone expected a duel between Kobe and him in the finals. Instead, the Lakers got bounced in the second round. Phil Jackson retired due to medical problems, and the team that went to three straight finals was disbanded. The Lakers tried to participate in the super team extravaganza of the early 2010s by trading for Dwight Howard and Steve Nash, but that experiment failed miserably. Kobe tore his Achilles, and the team went into a rebuild mode, making that Kobe's fifth and final championship ring that he'll ever have. This video has been sponsored by Underdog Fantasy. Guys, tensions are rising in the NBA as the postseason is right around the corner. And Underdog Fantasy wants to help you get in on the fun with Underdog Fantasy's pick'em game and an irresistible offer. New customers get a 100% deposit match up to $100 and receive a pick'em special in your lobby. Here's how it's done. Download the Underdog Fantasy app, sign up using code LOCKDOWNK, choose the pick'em game, and pick at least two players from at least two different teams for your pick'em entry. And then from there, pick if they are going to have higher or lower of any stat shown. I'd choose a pick'em special as one of them. Track the players in your lineup to potentially win huge jackpots. Pick'em's not the game for you? Well then try Underdog's Draft. Personally, my favorite game, where I can compete directly against other users or create a private draft between my friends or subscribers and I and see who comes out the victor out of our small group. Check this map here to see if Underdog is available in your area. Again, download the Underdog Fantasy app today. You can use my code LOCKDOWNK when signing up to get a 100% bonus on your first deposit of up to $100. That's promo code LOCKDOWNK only on Underdog Fantasy. Now, back to the video. Dirk Nowitzki is an NBA legend. He's the first European player to win an NBA MVP. He's only one of seven players to score over 30,000 points. And as of 2023, he's a Hall of Famer. But once upon a time, people weren't sure what to make of him. In 2006, he reached the finals with the Mavs, leading 2-0, then lost four straight games. The next year, he won MVP. His team had the best record in the league, and he lost in the first round becoming only the third player to win MVP without progressing past the first round. In case you are wondering, you had Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in 1976 and Moses Malone in 1979 and 1982. So this was a major blow to Dirk's reputation. He said in the latter half of his career, and we can safely say Dirk Nowitzki missed the boat as an alpha dog. All of that changed after the 2010 through 2011 season. At the beginning of the 2011 season, the Mavs were seventh on the list of title favorites. What made this team different? Was this a title fluke? Were they just a good team that got hot at the right time? No, the Mavs were a great team. They were just missing a piece. And that piece was Jason Terry's tattoo of the Larry O'Brien trophy. I believe we can win. I don't know about y'all. Ready for takeoff, baby. We got the team to do it. I'm gonna get a tattoo of the trophy right now to show you what I mean. Show up to shoot around the next morning, coach done talking. I show coach. I'm serious, baby. We gonna win it all this year, right here. I got a tattoo to prove it. Obviously joking, they needed something else. And that piece came in the preseason. So what had happened was pretty simple. So as I said before, the Mavs were desperately missing a piece, a defensive piece. In earlier playoff series against the Heat and Warriors, teams were able to exploit the Mavericks' lack of rim protection, often targeting Dirk on drives. Luckily for the Mavericks, Tyson Chandler, a perennial Defensive Player of the Year candidate, was on the market. Chandler was supposed to be traded from the Bobcats to the Raptors first. His manager even told him that the deal was done. However, the deal fell through, and the Mavericks managed to snatch him in a huge blockbuster deal. Basically, Chandler and Dirk were a perfect fit for each other. Dirk excelled in areas Chandler didn't, scoring, shooting, and creating plays, while Chandler was dominating in rebounding, interior offense, and defense. The addition allowed Dirk to focus more on his offensive game and even caused defenses to give him slightly more space. With Chandler on board, the Mavericks became a top 10 defensive team in the league. 
they were also very team oriented. They were like the revenge team of the 2000s. They had members of multiple teams that came closer to a title only to lose to eventual champions. I mean, Jason Kidd, Sean Marion, Peja Stojakovic, heck, even Terry and Dirk were members of the 2006 losing team. The team also had a knack for straight dominating fourth quarters and closing out tight games. Here's a closer look at their clutch performance. In clutch situations defined by NBA.com, Dallas played 50 games and secured 34 wins, a 68% success rate, ranking third in the league. The Mavs started the regular season strong, winning 24 out of the first 31 games. While they did fall off a bit around the midseason mark, the Mavs went on a 23-10 run to finish the regular season. Yeah, Dallas was ready for the playoffs, and the league wasn't ready for that. Their 2011 run started with a bang. They battled LaMarcus Aldridge and Brandon Roy for six games in a series that featured Roy's last hurrah in his short but legendary NBA career. Here's Roy, it's a two, and it's good. Roy for the lead, banks it in. 84-82. In the second round, they faced the defending champions, the Lakers who were dealing with internal turmoil. The series is now mostly remembered for our test hitting JJ Barea in the face. Mavs and the soft label. Whoa. Bynum elbowing JJ Barea. Not backing down. Barea, oh look at that. Oh, that is Bynum. And Phil Jackson hitting Gasol at timeouts. Tired of watching, go ahead and guard it. Now we have a laying of. Yeah, this was kind of a weird series. The Mavs swept the champions in four games and moved to the Western Conference Finals to face the young OKC team. While the Thunder managed to even out the series 1-1, the Mavs finished the job quickly, sending the young team home in five. At the beginning of the series, the Mavs definitely weren't the favorites. Even though they did win the last 10 games they played against the Heat, they were still listed as five-point underdogs on most online sportsbooks. The series got off to a rough start, with Dirk injuring his finger in game one and the Mavs trailing 2-1. In the pivotal game four, the series took a turn. The night before, I go home and start shivering a little bit and started to call. I was like, oh, I probably just need to go to bed and I'll be great tomorrow, but it just didn't happen that way. The trainer comes in and says, Dirk's sick. Huh? Sick? What do you got? He was like, we got the flu. Oh, I said, oh, no, 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 no. Not right now. Not in this moment. Think of the video of uh, Wade and LeBron coughing. Dwayne said that uh, that was a real cough, by the way. Well, I just thought it was a little childish, a little, little ignorant. Dirk played with a fever. He struggled with shots early on, but the rest of the team did their job. They did what they were able to do the entire season. One, play amazing defense and protect the paint. Two, play team ball and find the open man at the right time. And three, come back from a deficit and win a close game. For LeBron, this was arguably the worst game of his entire career. He was infamously outplayed by Jason Terry, of all people. James back on Terry, one dribble, pull up, puts it in. The Mavs closed the last game in Miami and won the first and so far the only championship trophy in their history. And what have they been able to do since? Well, as a team, not much. The following season, they lost Tyson Chandler, who went to the Knicks and won Defensive Player of the Year. They also lost in the first round. And in 2013, the team failed to make the playoffs. The Mavericks never reached the success they had between 2001 and 2011, despite efforts to strengthen the team around Dirk. But hey, Dirk got a statue and a street named after him out of the whole ordeal. Not bad. Hall of Fame nominee and finals MVP back in 2011, the only player in NBA history to play 21 years with the same team. In the early 2010s, LeBron wasn't the most popular player. Okay, fine, in terms of jersey sales, marketability, and name recognition, he was. But he wasn't very liked among NBA fans, especially Reginald. I feel horrible, disappointed. I can't believe that he would do that to Cleveland. I hope he never wins any championships wherever he's at, because he's a loser, he's not a winner. Many saw his move to the Heat and teaming up with Bosch and Wade as a weak move. All of their success seemed undeserved. People love rooting for the underdog. And let me tell you, the Heatles were far from it. That's why when the Heat lost to Dirk and the Mavericks, many people were happy. The team collapsed under pressure. Many questioned LeBron's ability to win. Skip Bayless started talking nonsense about clutch genes and such. This was his turn and his time to live up to being a back-to-back -back MVP and the most talented player this game has ever seen. And this time, he wasn't even La Robin James. He was La Alfred James. This was just pathetic. Al and LeBron was fed up. Because at the end of the day, 
Um, all the people that was rooting on me to fail, you know, at the end of the day, they got to wake up tomorrow and have the same life that they had um, before they woke up today. Now, I'm not trying to give a revisionist take here. The Heat did collapse on the biggest stage, yes. But let's give the Mavs some credit. They did defend him correctly. Throw a zone against Bron. All you had to do is get him to hesitate, one or two, because Bron's always going to make the right play. And when you're facing a zone and you, ha you have to read what they're doing, is it match up, going whatever it may be, that slowed him down. Even today, at nearly 40 years old, LeBron can run through multiple defenders and finish at the rim. Back in his prime, he was a freight train. You couldn't stop him even if you tried wrapping your hands around him. So the fact that he was settling for jumpers in the closing minutes of games was heavily I mean heavily criticized. The Mavericks defense effectively pressured the Miami Heat, particularly LeBron James, by inching up and forcing him into unfavorable shooting positions, leading to less efficient shots. I can't believe the whole series was like this. Coach Eric Spolstra's decision to rely more on isolation plays rather than double high post sets, which had previously been successful, contributed to the situation. It limited LeBron's ability to drive to the basket and made him settle for jump shots. So despite having the most talented team in the league, the Heat still weren't the best. They had some holes in their game that could be exploited, and LeBron and co weren't having that. So LeBron spent the whole offseason working on his game. He worked with Hakeem to improve his post-up game and developed a turnaround shot that he could rely on late in the game. Again, travel, he spent 50 dollars. He spent 50 grand to travel. 50 thousand, 50 thousand a week. You crazy? Some old ass moves. Yeah, Gil, but these old moves did the job. That's yeah. when he started getting in that post. He started getting ugly. That's, and that's when it got ugly. Because when he started getting in the post, drawing fouls, mm -hmm. control, you con now we control, control the tempo. The, the Heat had three starters, so they weren't chasing any big players. They added sharpshooters like Shane Battier, who could help the team spread the floor and free up the lane for LeBron and Wade. Due to the lockout, Miami played only 66 games that season, winning 46 of them. If they played a regular season, they were on pace to win at least 57 games. LeBron, Wade, and Bosch were all-stars. James won the MVP again, and the team won their division. In the first round, we finally got a LeBron Carmelo matchup that we've been waiting for for nearly a decade, and it didn't really live up to the hype, with the Heat finishing the job in just five games. Next came the Pacers. In this series, the Pacers gave the Heat some problems, taking them to six games and even having a 2-1 lead at one point. But Miami took care of business. In the conference finals, LeBron faced his biggest rivals at the time, the Boston Celtics. Yeah, and while the Celtics took the Heat to seven games, LeBron dominated, giving us one of the best performances in game six with 45 points, 15 rebounds, and five assists, and one of the toughest stare downs in league history. Yeah, can't forget about that. In the final game of the series, D Wade and Braun combined put up 54 points to repel the Heat to another final series. In 2011, Miami faced an old experienced team playing team basketball. Basically, the total opposite happened in 2012. Durant and Westbrook were both 23, while Ibaka and Harden were 22. Their veterans like Perkins still weren't even in their 30s. Still, they were talented. They actually surprised the Heat in Game 1 to lead the series 1-0. Some even believed they could win it all. Shout out Mike Carroll. Love the confidence, my man. Unfortunately, they lost the next four games straight. They had a chance to tie Game 2 in the last seconds, but Durant missed the go-ahead jumper. OKC also managed to get within one point in the last 90 seconds of Game 3, but they couldn't close it out. Game 4 was sort of close, but Russ and Katie were the only Thunder players to score in the last quarter, and Game 5 wasn't close at all. So the series was kind of close, but not really. The Heat simply had three stars in their prime and more experience than OKC. So what about the next season? But we also know you three kings came down here to win championships, not one. After securing their second title as a franchise and their first title as the Big Three, the Heat entered the season with a ton of pressure lifted off of their shoulders. And that allowed for some amazing basketball. Five on the shot block. Of course, one title wasn't enough for this strong of a roster, but the hardest part of their job was done, and the Heat had some fun. Oh, and they also acquired two former Seattle sharpshooters in Rashard Lewis and Ray Allen. Until recently, Allen was a part of another Eastern Big Conference Big Three. His decision to sign with the Heat would create a rift between his Boston teammates that would last until this day. 
LeBron reached his final form in the 2012 through 2013 season. He was practically unstoppable. His stats were as good as always, but his shooting splits were amazing. He got his fourth MVP title in five years that season. He was also almost the first unanimous MVP in history, but one voter gave a first place vote to Carmelo. Could it be? As a team, the Heat were amazing. On their way to 66 wins, they went on a 27 game winning streak from February 3rd to March 27th, the second longest winning streak in history. Miami steamrolled through the first two rounds. They swept the Bucks in the first round, gave the Young Bulls a gentleman sweep in the second round, and in the conference finals, Indiana, led by Paul George and Roy Hibbert, took the Heat to seven games. The teams went back and forth in the first six games, splitting the series. Everyone expected a spectacular game seven, but things don't always turn out the way we want. Reality can be boring. In the finals, Miami met the Spurs dynasty. San Antonio had rolled through the Western Conference, defeating the Lakers, Warriors, and Grizzlies, allowing their opponents only two wins before taking the West. In the first four games, the series looked even, until Game 5, where the Spurs starting lineup scored more than 100 points, leading the team to a 10-point victory. Miami looked in trouble. Now, we all remember the highlights, dunks, blocks, etc. But what many people forget is that LeBron didn't have a great series himself. As a matter of fact, over the first three games, he averaged less than 17 points on less than 40% from the floor. However, when it mattered most, LeBron stepped up. In game six, he made important plays down the line to keep the heat in the game. Chalmers to James, big finish. Didn't lose his composure, eight minutes to play. James working on Leonard in the post. And when the weight of the world fell on LeBron's shoulders and he just couldn't make one more shot, he was bailed out. James catches, puts up the three. Won't go! Rebound box! Back out to Allen! His three-pointer! Bang! Ray Allen's iconic three-pointer in Game 6 of the Finals against the Spurs remains one of the most clutch moments in NBA history. Allen led the game to overtime, the Heat extended the series to Game 7, and Braun gave the Spurs 37-12 in Game 7 to win another chip and Finals MVP. What happened then? The Heat did it again. Not one, not two, four straight finals. However, they failed to win another chip. Age, injuries, and a hungry, well-oiled Spurs basketball team were the main culprits. LeBron left in 2014, Wade's needs were failing, and Bosch had a serious blood clot problem that forced him into early retirement. And until further notice, that was the end of the Heat. After a heartbreaking loss, your team is most likely to lose its core. I mean, it happens all the time. LeBron left the Cavs after losing to Boston, Durant left the Thunder after blowing a 3-1 lead to the Warriors, and Ben Simmons demanded a trade after Philly lost to Atlanta. And these are just a couple of famous examples, but one didn't the 2013 San Antonio Spurs. A single Ray Allen three-pointer left the Spurs ringless in the 2012 through 2013 season. Just a few days later after the loss, Greg Pop assembled his big three that helped him win the last three championships and asked, were they gonna run it back or not? At first, the guys weren't sure. They said they needed more time to think, but surely they decided they were going to give it another shot. The team stayed together despite a devastating disappointment. As Pat Riley noted, they found their nirvana through their adversity, Riley says. That doesn't happen often like that when you lose the way they did in 2013. It usually destroys a team and makes them go the other way, especially when there's aging. Their entire focus was on rematching the Heat. This time, they wanted to be prepared. First, they needed to find a way to neutralize their strongest weapon, the fast break. Due to their athleticism, the Heat was a superb defensive team especially in the playoffs. In 2013, they had the fourth highest defensive rating during the playoffs, and the Heat's ability to close out shooters and clog passing lanes allowed them to force turnovers and capitalize on them with easy fast break points. 27 points in the opening frame. Here's a steal by LeBron. Here comes a show. When teams allowed LeBron to stay in one spot, he would usually start playing in the passing lane and create offense off of steals. The Spurs' solution to this problem? Keep the players and the ball moving at all times. They played with last year was incredible. Diaw, nice fake. The Spurs were on a mission in 2014. They didn't lose a single game in March on their way to 19 straight wins. They finished the season with 62 wins, which was, at the time, their second best season record in franchise history. They achieved this with nothing but team play. Although no one averaged more than 17 points a game, six players averaged 10 points a game, plus three more averaging at least eight, and no one played more than 30 minutes a game. They were playing what many call Euro-style basketball, where the ball moves around constantly. The team doesn't rely on individual players, and your coach yells a lot. Besides Duncan, Parker, and Ginobili, Kawhi Leonard emerged as a defensive stud and a potential star in the making. The playoffs started slowly. 
with a sluggish seven game series with the Mavs. However, they managed to beat Portland in five and the KD Russ Thunder in six games. And despite winning four titles in the previous two decades, this was the first time the Spurs made back to back finals. San Antonio was ready for a rematch and seemingly so was the Heat. They rolled through the East without much trouble. I mean, they swept the Hornets, had a gentleman sweep with the Nets, and eliminated the Pacers in six games. And they looked like they were ready for a three-peat. The Spurs won game one by 15. Every San Antonio player scored, and no one had over 21 points. But the game was remembered for LeBron's cramping problems at the end. Good crossover by James, and on the landing, immediately cramps up. The Heat took a close game too. LeBron had 35 points and 10 rebounds, and the series moved to Florida. Over the final three games, the Spurs shot an astounding 65.1% from the field. Their offensive rating was 124.9, at the time, the highest recorded. They also won these three games by an average of more than 19 points. Considering that the other team had the best player of his generation in his prime, this was pretty unbelievable. Kawhi Leonard became the third member of the Spurs dynasty to win finals MVP. And if you know, you know. He mainly won it because of this LeBron reaction. Kawhi Leonard checks in the game as LeBron James is shooting a free throw. <laughs> that face? And what happened to the Spurs? Well, age, a strong Western Conference, and a bit of bad luck. Next year, the Spurs had a 57-win season, but lost to the Clippers on a CP3 game winner. Green. They lost to the Thunder in 2016, Duncan retired, they went to the conference finals in 2017, but then the Zaza thing happened, then the Kawhi situation happened, Mono retired, and Tony went to the Hornets. And now, we're just waiting for Wemby to return the Spurs to their glory days. Yeah, that might take a while. And we just scratched the surface with this decade. The beginning might have been wild, but wait until the Golden State Warriors hit the scene. Until that point in history, no one thought a jump shooting and three point heavy team could win it all. I don't like jump shooting teams. I don't think you can win the championship being good teams shoot jumpers. And wait until I tell you about this thing called small ball. But I don't think the NBA all of a sudden is gonna have a bunch of three point shooters and uh, play in a bunch of small lineups. I'll just have to leave all that for the next video, since this was an exciting decade and already a long video. Oh yeah, if you want me to continue this series, let me know in the comments.